For I am persuaded, and you better be persuaded too, my friends, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah, so we are eternally secure because God has promised to keep us. It is the very nature of salvation. Again, the eternal security of the believer is a doctrine that has been greatly under attack. Sadly, there are many people, including so-called Christians, that is, that who have no real assurance of salvation do this. And there are many Christians that go through that. I believe they're Christians. So it's imperative that you here fully understand that once you're saved, you can never lose that which was freely given to you in the first place. You can't lose your salvation. You were either saved or you weren't saved to begin with. So last week we looked at why we were eternally secure. And we were eternally secure because it's God's nature. It's, it's in His very nature to keep you. A God who can't keep you is a God who is weak in my estimation. He is weak. And we are eternally secure because it's the nature of salvation itself. Salvation is a birth, the new birth. Now I want you to think of this for a moment. It is impossible for us to be unborn again, or is it possible rather, for us to be unborn again after we've been born again, is it? Well, no. John, uh, let's turn there, John 3, verses 5 and 6. Is it impossible for us to be unborn again after we've been born again? Or possible for us, rather, to be unborn again after we've been born again? Once you're born again, you can't undo that second birth. You hear about those who I've been born again. I used to be born again. Well, no. That means you're dead. John 3, verses 5 and 6, Jesus answered Nicodemus here. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Right? And the water here is not baptism. It's not the water of the baptistry. It's really the water of the natural or physical birth. That's what it is. It's an analogy here. What breaks when a, when a woman's about to give birth to a child, to a baby? Her water. Her water. Salvation is a gift. And it is a gift, and a gift rather is something that the receiver does nothing to merit in order to receive it. Otherwise, it would be a reward, something you've earned. A gift is not a gift if it can be taken back. Otherwise, it would be a loan, not a gift. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. And the reason why is that you will boast, lest any man should boast. People always are boasting about of their good works. Oh, I did this. I do that. I keep kosher. I, go, I fast on Yom Kippur. I go to the synagogue and pray 12 hours a day. I do this. I do that. I'm a good man. I'm going to try to be good. I'm not as this publican. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a gift. Amen. The gift of God is eternal life. I want us to know that eternal life is not the payment of wages. It's not. A man cannot work for and earn eternal life. You can't. It is the gift of God and it is only through the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Salvation is a satisfaction. Let's turn to John 4 and verse 13. I tell you, there's no in-between with that thing. It either you're freezing in here or you're cooking. Yeah. 
Feels like a sauna right now. <laughs> I'm baking here. Pretty soon you'll be able you need to take me out the oven. We'll be ready. John 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said unto whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Right? The water of the well there. He's speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well there. Samaria. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 6, verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. And by the way, the bread of life is not that pagan heathen wafer that they have going on here at the Roman Catholic Church, St. Rose of Lima. They're a bunch of carnivores. That's a Roman Catholic church. Not carnivore. What do you call it? Uh, cannibals. We are, well, we're carnivores of eat meat, but they're cannibals. Got the wrong word there. Thank you. What well, blessed words, my friends. <laughs> Amen, brother. Never thirst again. Never hunger. Never thirst again. Never hunger. Of course, you're going to hunger and thirst. And in an earthly sense, for food, spiritually speaking, you'll never. Amen. Never means never. Men have a problem, however. They usually understand the spiritual thirst and try to quench it with the stagnant waters of the flesh and of this world. And the result of this is poison and death. The stagnant waters of the flesh are such things as lust fornication, all kinds of immorality, drunkenness, indulgence, pride, the list goes on. We saw that on, on Thursday night, didn't we? In abundance, all of it. Stagnant, stinky waters of the flesh. Bacteria and all manner of disease grows in that. The stagnant waters of the world are such things as the love of money. Material things, cars, houses, lands, your career. That's what the world has. That's what they live for. My warehouse manager has like five vehicles. And her license plate says Empress. That tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> you think? No humility? Amen. Amen. <laughs> You know what? That's a scary place to be. Because the time will come when God will bring her down. Amen. I like her. I like Him to bring her down for salvation. Amen? Amen. The stagnant waters of the flesh in the world can never quench a man's thirst. They are like salt water. They make a man crave for more and more. That's what actually sin does. You crave for more and more and you're never satisfied. It's like drinking salty water. If a man comes to Christ, he will never hunger. The gnawing, the gnawing of salvation, the craving for life will be fully satisfied. Yeah, when you come to Christ, you'll never hunger. Your craving for life will be fully satisfied. I have a lot more in Jesus Christ now than I ever did before I came to him. You know, in the summer, remember, Brad, we were talking about this. We were walking right through that club district there or down Queen Street with all those bars uh, late at night because we were coming back. And I was like, brother, I don't miss this. I, I'm absolutely disgusted by it. And I, don't, I can't believe I was actually a part of that at one time in my life. I don't miss this. Yeah. <clears throat> if a man believes, he will never thirst. Now the picture that is symbolism is switched from hunger to thirst. Man's need is more than met. Not only is his hunger satisfied, but his thirst is quenched. By the way, the rich man in hell, he's thirsting, but that thirst will never quench. He just wants a dip of that water. He wants Lazarus. Just, just, just dip a little bit of that water and just give me. I just to quench this thirst. I'm in torment. That's right, that's right. Every need of life, of nourishment, and of growth is met 
through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in Him only. Nothing is left out or lacking when we are in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. When a person comes to Christ and believes, every need of his life and growth is met. It's ongoing. It's continuous. Of course, this does not mean he will never hunger after righteousness. We ought to hunger after righteousness. You ought to have a voracious appetite for righteousness. Amen? Amen? He will, but his hunger and thirst will never go unsatisfied, for he shall be filled. I'd like us to note now the words, not never, for they are strong and emphatic words. No, shall never. No, shall never. Never thirst, never hunger, for he shall never leave thee nor forsake thee. These are emphatic words. Amen. Amen. Salvation is satisfaction. I have complete satisfaction in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's nothing that this world could offer me that I don't have in Jesus Christ. There's nothing. Nothing. The best that the world can offer you pales. It's like, it's like filth. It's like this cesspool. It's like sewage. And compared, in comparison rather, to what our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, offers us. True. Salvation brings both eternal and everlasting life. Eternal simply means no beginning and no ending. And everlasting means no ending. Very similar. They're used interchangeably. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3 verses 15 and 16. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. In other words, die in their sins. And go to hell, but have everlasting life. John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. We had some men, a couple of effeminate looking men, mocking, I think when Brad was preaching, they were making fun of the way you were announcing and the way you were preaching. And I'm just thinking... God's wrath is on you right now. He's a, God's wrath is abiding on you. How dare you? can make fun of the preacher. Who cares? Do you think he cares? And you're out there on Halloween doing whatever you're doing, you filthy perverts. And they are filthy perverts, some of those men. Some of the things you were saying were utterly disgusting and vile. For some reason, they think they have one up on us when they, when they say the most vile things to us. Look, you're going to give an account for every idle word that you've uttered right now at this moment that you've spoken. You'll give an account for that. I understand your righteous indignation. That's why I was like, praise, glory to God, he's preaching there. Brother, would you like to preach? Uh, I don't know. And then, you know, he's there moving the sides. We're going for a walk. Next thing you know, wait a minute. <laughs> I hear him preaching the way. They're plowing corn. Amen. Good. John 4, 14, follow along with me. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall, uh, the, the, the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I will repeat, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, that's a promise, by the way. Shall is a very emphatic promise. Shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Those were the word shall, the verb shall there is a very strong promise. When God says he will do it, he's going to do it. Amen. When Jesus says, I shall, rest assured, he shall. He's going to perform that which he has promised to perform. John 5 and verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus saith here, and he's still saying this to you, by the way, He that heareth my word, were they hearing the word? I hope so on Thursday when we're preaching to those lost sinners, and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Yeah, past. we're a past from death into life. We're no longer dead in trespasses and sins. We are alive. We are quickened. 
We were walking amongst the dead on Thursday night there. True. They were celebrating death. Yeah. That's what Halloween is, is a celebration of death. We're celebrating life in Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the life, and He's the one who will give you life. And He will give it you more abundantly. Amen. I came that they might have life, and, and that they might have it more abundantly, Jesus saith. Wow. Some of the things, that was something else. Last year was something else. But the year this year, because the weather was warmer, it was packed. Remember that, uh, that woman there with the, uh, who got mad at the abortion sign? She's killed a baby in her womb. She's had an abortion. There's no way a woman reacts that way. She was livid. And her boyfriend, I'm assuming it's her boyfriend, not her husband. It was a boyfriend. Uh, Christina, just just leave, Christina. Come, there's Christina. Forget about it, Christina. Forget about it. She was livid. Her conscience was being pricked, and she couldn't handle that. What she doesn't know is that she can be forgiven. Exactly. The blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse that sin. She's a hellbound sinner, but that child that she's murdered in her womb is with the Lord. John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Never means never. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's eternal security right there. And that man includes yourself. Again, eternal means no beginning and no ending, and everlasting means no ending. These are used interchangeably. And the Christian possesses both eternal life. That is the believer in Christ and everlasting life, the Christ, that is Christ in the believer. Amen. If salvation ultimately depends upon our enduring to the end, Then John 3.16, along with a host of other scriptures, we'll have to read this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him may potentially perish if he fails to walk in perfect obedience in this life, and therefore he's on probation in this life. That's what I should read. There's something to that effect. True. Our salvation is not probation. It's secured in Christ. See, the thing is, if you're continually walking in disobedience and you've never walked in obedience, you've never been born again, you've never received Christ. If, you're, if you claim to be a Christian and, the, and are walking in disobedience, yet there's no chastening in your life, you're a bastard. You're not a son. You're a bastard. You're not a son. Salvation brings both eternal and everlasting life. Salvation is also an inward change. We are eternally secure because it is the very nature of God's salvation. And it brings forth and produces within us an inward change. As believers, we receive the divine nature. This is also known as the new man. Put on, we're commanded to put on the new man. It's the new man. The inward man. 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these things ye might be partakers of what? The divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Amen. Amen. That we are partakers of the divine nature, given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Wow. Amen. The promises are those that have to do with the divine nature of God. The divine nature that is planted within the heart of a person who believes in Jesus Christ, every born-again believer. When a person receives Jesus Christ, when they repent and they believe, God sends His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell, and to indwell, rather, the heart of every believer. God places within the heart of the believer His own divine nature and then makes Him a new creature. In doing so, He makes Him a new creature and a new man. Put on the new man. The believer is actually born again spiritually. 
He partakes of the divine nature of God through the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Salvation is an inward change. Therefore, it will produce fruit. I preach that. As believers, we receive the divine nature. And this is an inward change wrought entirely by the Spirit of God. And it is in an irreversible change. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old things are passed away. Old things. We are truly a new person in Christ. We are truly a new creature in Christ. And the grip of a great God molds us into a new creation in Christ or new creations in Christ. The transformation that is brought about through the new birth and by the new birth is not only an instantaneous miracle produced by God Himself and only by God, but also a lifelong process of sanctification. Justification is instantaneous. Positional sanctification is instantaneous. But Christian maturity is a lifelong process. Sanctification Speaking of Christian growth and being set apart from sin and unto God is a lifelong process. Some Christians never go beyond being a child, being a, bi being a babe in Christ. For those who transform everything changes. The old things have passed away and all things become new. The word become is in the perfect tense indicating a past act with continuing results. God, in other words, God is continually working in our lives. When we are gripped by a great God, our great God, the Lord God, Jehovah, old values, ideas, plans, our love, what we love, our desires, well, all our old beliefs are replaced by the new things that accompany salvation. Our minds are renewed. We think differently. We, we, we value certain things differently or we value things differently, if you will, compared to what we used to value. We don't value the world anymore. We don't. And you become content. You ought to become content with what things you have. I understand your flesh can make you covetous. I understand that. You should, I have no desire for the things of this world. Really, I don't. I really don't. Yes, you need certain things as a necessity. But you should be prepared to lose it. You should be prepared to lose that. And not bat an eyelid when you have lost it. Because God can take everything away from you. So what is new in our life? Here's some new things for Christians. First of all, we have a new birth. John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, that's Nicodemus, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When you're born again, you've been spiritually changed. This is the new birth. When you're born again, you receive a new heart, a new spirit. These are these new things. Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also I'll give you. This is to Israel, but we can make an individual application. And a new spirit will I put within you. And it will take away the stony heart of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. By the way, you can preach out of Ezekiel 36 to the Jew. The gospel's right in there. I'm telling you, you can preach a message right on the streets to the Jew using that uh, passage right there. You become a new man. Ephesians 4.24 And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen? You're given a new song. Psalm 40 and verse 3 And he hath put a new song in my mouth even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. He's given you a new name. Isaiah 62 and verse 2. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. And all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name. Which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Revelation 2 verse 17. He that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And will give him a white stone. 
and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. You're given a new home. John 14, verses 1 and 2, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's right. In other words, he goes to make ready a place for us to prepare. It is drawn, this word here, the prepare is drawn from an oriental custom of setting on before kings on their journeys, persons to level the roads and make them passable. The Lord is preparing our homes for us. He's preparing our mansion. Oh, we got a mansion. Say, you may live in the dingy apartment. Who cares? Or in the basement of a house, who knows? Who cares? We've got a mansion, amen? You're all invited. you all invited. You can have some fried chicken, some watermelon. <laughs> amen. 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 <laughs> Promised a new body in Christ. Second Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'd like to quote, uh, quote uh, Matthew Henry on this verse here. He says, This ought to be the care of all who profess the Christian faith, that they be new creatures, not only that they have a new name and wear a new livery, but that they have a new heart and new nature. Well, livery, I think that's, if, I, if I'm mispronouncing that, forgive me. And so great is the change, the grace so great is the change the grace of God makes in the soul that as it follows, old things are passed away. Old thoughts, old principles, and old practices are passed away. And all these things must become new. Now he goes, regenerating grace, or note that regenerating grace creates a new world in the soul. All things are new. The renewed man acts from new principles, by new rules, with new ends, and in new company. Amen. Salvation is an inward change. Those who believe that one can lose his or her salvation or their salvation do not appreciate the fact that just as the sinner cannot change his sinful nature in and of himself, so the saint cannot change the divine nature that God has given you with, or given you. Salvation is an inward change. It is a present possession. Amen? The Word of God speaks of salvation as our now, at this very moment, and not something that's just afar off. You can be saved now. Salvation can be instantaneous. You can live out your salvation now. For some who claim to be Christian, that's all they believe it is. That's the whole kingdom now theology. Salvation is not something that we receive after death and therefore have the potential to miss out upon salvation on the last, or upon it upon, at the last minute or miss out on it in the last minute. No, it's something you can have now. In fact, there's no salvation after death. Zero salvation after death. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Again, I'm going to repeat John 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, are you hearing? When we're preaching those lost sinners, were they hearing? He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That's a promise. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Jesus saith, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man, any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Oh, you're eternally secure, my friend, if you know Jesus Christ. You can't lose it. The Pentecostals have it wrong. You can't lo lose that which was freely given. If you're saved by grace, you're not kept by works. Works won't keep you. But if there's no works, then there's no true saving grace. 
Salvation is not something, something we hope to receive after death. This is what every religious system outside of biblical Christianity and outside of what God's Word says and proclaims believes. It's what the Jew believes. It's what the, what the, what the Muslim believes through Islam. They've got their own perverted view of heaven. Their own uh, lustful, perverted, stinking, perverted view of heaven. You know, Islam is nothing more than the religion of filthy lust. That's all it is. Filthy, stinking lust. That's Islam in a nutshell. And it's what the Roman Catholic Church believes. Now I want to read you something here. This is what the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church says. The Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church defines purgatory, right? In other words, you know, salvation after you die as a purification. My Bible says in the blood of Jesus Christ purifies us, right. cleanses us. So as to achieve the holiness. Actually, let me go there. Let's go to Ephesians uh, 5, I think in verse 20. Before I read on there. With all these Bible verses that come to my head. Okay. Okay, yeah. verse 25. 20. Husbands, verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Right? And this we know is a self-sacrificial love. One, a love that is willing to, uh, to lay down his life for his, for his bride, for his wife. Right? In this case, the church. Right? Uh, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a, a, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish that is a pure church my friend without blemish but they teach that pure, defines purgatory as a purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Where's that in the Bible? Which is experienced by those who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified. They redefine what grace means. It's no longer the unmerited favor of God. So these, these Catholics are in hell thinking that they're in purgatory. It notes, it goes on here, it notes that, quote, this final purification of the elect is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Where is that in the Bible? The purification is necessary, it says, because as Scripture teaches, nothing unclean will enter the presence of God in heaven. And they quote Revelation 21 to 27. And while we may die with our mortal sins forgiven, there can still be many impurities in us, specifically venial sins and the temporal punishment due to sins already forgiven. There's mortal sins according to the Catholic Church and venial sins. Nonsense. All sin will lead you to hell. That's right. And the blood of Jesus Christ and His blood alone can cleanse you of all sin. Right. It washes you clean. Not purgatory, not some prayers of, uh, not some vain prayers to some dead saint or to Father Solanus solely or prayers taken to Father Solanus solely. That was something else when you sent that video, brother. They are actually, what do you call it, the beatification of this, of this uh, so-called Roman Catholic, uh, whatever, father, quote-unquote. And the, whoever that, that Roman Catholic priest, what was he saying, I urge your... I, to this effect, I urge you to take your prayers solely to Father Solanus now. Never mind Mary or the dead saints. Take it directly to Father Solanus. Never mind the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, the Son. Take it solely to... Actually, brother, you have to listen to this. Take your prayers solely to Father Solanus. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like me praying, you know what? I'm going to take my prayers solely to my dad who's in heaven right now. I'm going to pray to my dad. It's no different. I'm going to pray to my dad. My earthly father who is now in heaven with the Lord. You think he can hear my prayers? Foolishness. They quote Revelation 21, 27. They shall, they shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, 
neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, you know what? It's right, this verse. But I've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't need to go to purgatory. I don't need to see, I don't need some dead uh, Roman Catholic priest saying some, 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 some uh, vain prayers, some vain repetitions on my behalf. The blood of Jesus Christ has removed that which hath, which hath defiled me. So what happens in purgatory, it says here? When we die, they say, we undergo what is called the particular or individual judgment. I'm reading right now what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. It goes on to say, Scripture says, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quoting King James, I'm, I'm quoting exactly what they say here. It is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Well, they're contradicting themselves right there. So if the judgment has come, there's no purification happening. It goes on to say, we are judged instantly and receive our reward for good or ill. We know at once what our de final destiny will be. They're just speaking on both sides like a, like, a, like a snake, like a serpent, both sides of their mouth here. At the end of time, when Jesus returns, it will come the general judgment to which the Bible refers. For example, in Matthew 5, verses 21, 20, uh, 25, verses 31 and 32. And I'm going to quote what they say here. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will visit on His glorious throne before Him, will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Of course, I've taken all of these scriptures out of context. It goes on to say here, in this, in this general judgment, all our sins will be public, publicly revealed. And they reference Luke 12, uh, 12 verses 2 through 5. And now they go on to uh, quote Augustine here. Augustine said in the city of God that, quote, temporary punishments are suffered by some in this life only, by others after, by, uh, by others both now and then, but all of them before, <clears throat> before that last and strictest judgment. He continues on here. It is between the particular and general judgments then that the soul is purified the remaining consequences of sin. I tell you, then he quotes uh, Jesus here in Luke 12, verse 59, and it's what it says here, I tell you, you will never get out till you have paid the very last copper wolf. Now, this is not what our King James Bible says, but even then, it's just misapplying scripture here, what Jesus said, right? By the way, who, who cares what a, what a, what a quote-unquote church father said? Who cares what Augustine said? Augustine right now, I'll tell you right now, is burning in hell. He's burning in hell. Why are you, what, what are you Calvinists, Augustinianism? You're following a man who's burning in hell. The theology of a man who's burning in hell. So is John Calvin, by the way. He's burning in hell. It goes on to say, when a Catholic requests a memorial mass for the dead, that is, a mass. Where's mass in the Bible, by the way? A mass said for the benefit of someone in purgatory. It is customary to give the parish priest a stipend. On the principles that the laborer's worth is higher. <laughs> it's, it's, it's principle to bribe the Roman Catholic priest. Oh, Father, here's. Maybe you can help bribe, bribe the Father, the, 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 the Roman Catholic Father. And those, goes on to say here, on the principles that the laborer is worthy of his hire. Talk about a perversion of Scripture. The Roman Catholic Church is like the master at resting Scriptures. And those who preside at the altar share the altar's offerings. And they reference 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. It goes on to say, in the United States, the stipend is commonly around $5. But, indigent to not, uh, but the indigent do not have to pay anything. A few people, of course, he continues to say, freely offer more. This money goes to the parish priest. And priests are allowed to receive only one such stipend per day. No one gets rich on $5 a day, and certainly not the church. Oh, they get rich. Oh, yeah, and people are giving more than $5 a day. Those that have it, they're, they're desperate. They're whipping out the big bucks. That mafia king there, is, you know, or Don uh, Colion or whatever his name is. Yeah, he's whipping out the big, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to pray, you got to pray. Uh, such and such right there out of, out of heaven, I don't know. Do you have some good mafia names there, guys? Tony. Tony. Yeah, Tony. Hey, 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 father. 
Here's the ear. How much? How much? Yeah. Let me get my briefcase. I'm going to pray my friend Tony out of purgatory. We're going to pray him out. <laughs> well, now you're laughing, eh, there? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Tony! <laughs> We're going to pray. Hey, don't worry, Tony. We're going to pray you out of heaven, out of purgatory, into heaven. We're going to pray you. Hey. That's the Italians. They go like that. I used to work with a lot of Italians, Norma. I used to do like this. Hey. By the way, they can be really religious, especially when someone dies. Oh, yeah. Whew, some of the most religious people are those mafia men. <clears throat> exactly. You know what? I, um, I was good friends before I got saved with a, with, a, with a gentleman whose dad, by the way, was a shriner. And this guy would live like the devil Saturday night. And I'm not going to get into this list of sins he was into. And then right into the Roman Catholic Church the next morning. <clears throat> That somehow kind of solved his conscience. But after I got saved, I started to witness to him. And I gave him a Roman, our Roman Catholics, Christians, uh, chick track. <laughs> after that, he would not talk to me ever again. He hated my guts. Goes on to say here, but look at what happens on the Sunday. There are often hundreds of people at Mass in a crowded parish. There may be thousands, probably over here too, there's tons there. Even at the Vietnamese mass, there they have the Vietnamese people coming. Many families and individuals deposit $5 or more into the collection basket, and a few give much more. A parish might have four or six, four or five or six masses on a Sunday. Wow. Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ is crucified six times on a Sunday. And the, and the priest is getting drunk. The total from the Sunday collections far surpasses the paltry amount received from the memorial masses. It goes on to say here, is purgatory a Catholic convention? Well, yeah, look at what they say here. Fundamentalists may be fond of saying the Catholic Church invented the doctrine of purgatory to make money, but they have difficulty saying just when. Most professional anti-Catholics, the ones who make their living attacking Romanism, seem to place the blame on Pope Gregory the Great, who reigned from 8590 to 604. But look at their argument here. They're actually going back to the church fathers. All those church fathers lead to Rome, every single one of them. But it hardly accounts for the requests of Monica, mother of Augustine, who asked her son in the 4th century to remember her soul in his masses. Well, Augustine's in hell, and so is she. This would make no sense if she thought her soul would not benefit from prayers, as would be the case if she were in hell or in the full glory of heaven. It goes on to say, Nor does ascribing the doctrine to Gregory explain the graffiti in the catacombs where Christians during the persecutions of the first few centuries recorded prayers for the dead. It goes on to say, Indeed, some of the earliest Christian writings outside of the New Testament, like the Acts of Paul and Thecla and the Martyrdom of Perpetua, and Felicity, both written during the second century, referred to the Christian practice of praying for the dead. Where is this in my Bible? Show me from the Word of God. Such prayers would have been offered only if Christians believed in purgatory, even if they did not use a name, that name for it. Now here, I'm going to actually go into a website here and come back to this. Uh, here's some quotations from, their, from another page on their website. And I'm going to quote some of uh, I'm going to quote some of the church. They, re they reference the church fathers, Tertullian. I don't care what Tertullian said; he was wrong on many things. I care what I care what Paul says on, as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. Tertullian was not moved by the Holy Ghost to pen the words of God. So what he said: We offer the sacrifices for the dead on their birthday anniversaries, the date of death, birth into eternal life. He also says a woman, after the death of her husband, prays for his soul and asks that he may, while waiting, find rest, and that he may share in the first resurrection. And each year, on the anniversary of his death, she offers the sacrifice. Now this is what Cyril of Jerusalem says. Then we make mention also of those who have already fallen asleep. First the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, that through their prayers and supplications, they're not praying for anything, if, 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 
they're in heaven, right? We're talking about they're in heaven. They're not praying for you. They're not praying. I, Moses is not praying for you. Amen. Abraham, Isaac, and, and, uh, and, and Jacob are not praying for you. Absolutely not. The prophets aren't praying for you. Absolutely not. The apostle Paul's not praying for you. Mary's not praying for you. Absolutely. God will receive our peti uh, petition. Next, we make mention also of the holy fathers and bishops who have already fallen asleep. And to put it simply, all among, of all among us who have already fallen asleep, for we believe that will be a very great benefit to the souls of, the, of those whom the petition is carried up while this holy and most solemn sacrifice is laid out. So that was Cyril of Jerusalem, Gregory of Nyssa. If a man distinguish himself in what is peculiarly human from that which is irrational, and if he be on the watch for a life of greater urbanity for himself, in this present life he will purify himself of any evil, con of any evil contracted, overcoming the irrational by reason. If he is inclined to the irrational pressure of passions, using the passions, the cooperating hide of, of things irrational, he may afterward, in quite different manner, be very much interested in what is better when after his departure out of the body he gains knowledge of the difference between virtue and vice and finds that he is not able to partake of divinity until he has been purged of the filthy contagion in his soul by purifying, by the purifying fire. So the Roman Catholic Church references the, the church, quote-unquote, fathers, the you know, so-called church fathers here. This is why I don't, you know, there's a lot of, even some of these Protestant denominations, even some within Baptist circles, they rely heavily on the church fathers. They're just a doorway to Rome. David Cloud was definitely right in what he was, right, what he was writing there. Chrysostom, I'll, I'll, I'll quote him. Let us help and commemorate them. If Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our offerings for the dead bring them some consolation? Let us not hesitate to those who have died and to offer our prayers for them. Well, Job's sons at that point weren't dead. <laughs> right? That's one quote. There's another one here. Weep for those who die in their wealth and who with all their wealth prepared no consolation for their own souls who had the power to wash away their sins and did not will do it. Let us weep for them. Wow, exactly. Let us weep for them. Let us assist them to the extent of our ability. Let us think of some assistance for them. Assistance uh, for them, small as it may be, yet let us somehow assist them. But how and in what way? By praying for them and by, and by entreating others to pray for them. By constantly giving alms to the poor on their behalf. Not in vain was decreed by the apostles that in some mysteries remembrance should be made of the departed. I'm not going to read on there. Augustine, I'll read a couple of quotes here. There's a number here that they've quoted. There is an ecclesiastical discipline, as the faithful know, when the names of the martyrs are read aloud in that place at the altar of God where prayer is not offered for them. Prayer, however, is offered for other dead who are remembered. It is wrong to pray for a martyr to whose prayers we ought ourselves to be commended. Wow. Another quote. But by prayers of the Holy Church and by the salvific sacrifice and by the alms which are given for the spirits, there is no doubt that the dead are aided, that the Lord might deal more mercifully with them than their sins would deserve. The whole church observes this practice, which was handed down by the fathers, that it prays for those who have died in the communion of the body and blood of Christ, when they are commemorated in their own place and the sacrifice itself, and the sacrifice is offered also in memory of them on their behalf, if then works of mercy are celebrated for the sake of those who are being remembered, who would hesitate to recommend them, on whose behalf prayers to God are not offered in vain? It is not all <clears throat> to be doubted that such prayers are profit to the, de to the dead, but for, the, for such of them as lived before their death in a way that makes it possible for these things to be useful to them after death. Here's, a, here's one more. I'll read one more here. Temporal punishments are suffered by some in this life, only by some after death, by some both here and hereafter, but all of them before the last and strictest judgment. But not all who suffer temporal punishments after, after death will come, will come to eternal punishments, 
which are to follow after that judgment. That's from the city of God. There's a few, many others. No, my dear friends, salvation is a present possession. There's no hope once you leave this world. No hope. You can twist scripture. You can rely on what the church fathers say. You can rely on vain tradition. But none of that's going to help. Salvation is a total work of grace needed for glory. To be sure, each Christian needs a real work of grace to live for the Lord as he intends. But as far as our eternal salvation is concerned, the Bible clearly says that we are complete in Him, that is Christ Jesus. Colossians 2.10, and you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. By the way, the head of all principality and power includes Satan the devil, of whom those people were worshipping. They serve the devil that we saw. Downtown there, they're worshiping death. And they're worshiping the devil through their observance of Halloween and other, other things that they are doing. Salvation places us positionally in heaven already. It's not a hope so, or I hope so. It is I know so. This is why we can go out in the streets and preach with such conviction and power. And the world is absolutely flabbergasted. They are confounded by the fact that we are preaching with conviction because we have a hope. We know so. It's an I hope so. I know so. Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, hath, hath, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace that you saved and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4, for ye, are, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, they were celebrating death on Thursday night, but Christ is our life, who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We are eternally secure. We are eternally secure because of the sure promises of God. For the Bible clearly states that we are preserved. Yes, as Christians we do persevere and we are called to persevere. But we do so because we are preserved. Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Psalm 31 verse 23. Oh, love the Lord, all ye saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewarded the proud doer. We are preserved. The Bible clearly states that we are preserved. And we are sealed. We are eternally secure. We are sealed. Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. Ephesians 4 and verse 13, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of the redemption. When God seals you, there's nothing on this, in this world, there's nothing in this creation that can break that seal. Amen? Amen? The seal refers to the official legal imprint in wax that holds the envelope closed. The sealing is divine and is done by the Holy Spirit. And the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life is a personal guarantee of heaven. You hear that? By the way, the presence of the Holy Spirit is not a charismatic presence that you see there. I'm not getting into that, but the eeny, meeny, miny, mo, sha la la, I'm not getting into the gibberish. We'll do that on Wednesday. We'll be spit. Wednesday will be our, our tongue speaking day. Right, brother? We'll be speaking in tongues. Well, I'm speaking in tongues right now. Do you realize I'm speaking in tongues? The English tongue, but I'm speaking in tongues, or a tongue. 
My wife speaks in tongues. She knows more than one language. She speaks in tongues. Some of you know more than one language. You know what that knows, what, three? Mm. Yes, you do. Don't shake your head. Tagalog, Gilakano, and English. There's three. I know Mrs. Gapi, too. You have your own local dialect there in Papanga, as well as Tagalog and English. A few others here. Archie, as well. And some of you, as well, know other languages. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, you're speaking in tongues as, you, as you're speaking to me. You're speaking to me in the English tongue. <laughs> the ceiling is unto the day of redemption, not until the day of backsliding, the day of redemption. By the way, that's when we put up, when this corruptible puts on incorruptible and this mortal puts on incorruptible. It's when we will be, get, when we will be given a new body. In Christ, you will be given a new body. In Christ... The body you will be given will never get sick. It will never die. It will never sin. Wow. There is a threefold aspect of salvation. In Christ, a great transaction is signed in the blood of the covenant. It is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, for He is the earnest. He is our down payment. And it is delivered, yet future, redemption of the body. Signed, sealed, and delivered. The Word of God says no one can take our salvation from us. We are eternally secure. John 10, verses 28 and 29. I've read that. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. No man is inc includes yourself. You realize that? The Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 8. Let's turn there. Romans 8. Verses 35 through 39. <clears throat> I have it unfolded here. We are promised that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus when you are born again. Romans 8, verse, starting in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Or distress? No. Or persecution? No. Or famine? No. Or nakedness? No. Or peril? No. Or sword? No. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, and all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen? Amen? For I am persuaded, and you better be persuaded too, my friends, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a promise. Probably that portion of Scripture there is probably the greatest portion of Scripture uh, concerning eternal security of the believer. I quoted this uh, last week. It was part of my last week's sermon, uh, but it's, I have to quote it again. You see, my dear friends, nothing can separate us from the life of God found only in Jesus Christ. Not death. Confronting death and leaving this world cannot separate us from Christ and His love. For we are passed on from death unto life. Not life itself, no trial or pleasure or comfort of life. Not any person or anything in this life can separate us from Christ and His love. Not angels, principalities or powers. No heavenly or spiritual creature. Not even Satan himself can separate you from the love of Christ. Not anything present or anything to come. Neither present events, things that are happening in the world. Don't worry about it. Don't fret over it. Nor future events, no matter how dire it may be. And it's going to get a whole lot worse. We know that from the Bible. Absolutely nothing in existence or anything in future existence can cut us off from the, Christ, from the love of Christ, from Jesus Christ and His love. Not height or depth, nothing, in the, nothing from the heavens above or from the depths of the earth below can separate, separate us from Christ and His love. None of that. None of that. The Bible says nothing can separate us 
from God's love. The Bible also says that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. As believers, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. When God has declared our destiny, how could, we, how could He be wrong? Let's turn to Romans 8, verse 29. And I'm going to close it off pretty soon. We often quote verse 28 here, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. Amen. This is to us. We've been predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son as believers. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 49. 15 and verse 49, sorry. 15 and verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Philippians 3 and verse 21. Mark these down. If I'm, the, I'm going quite quick now. Let's, starting verse 24, our conversation is in heaven, amen? From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who should change our vile body, that it may fashion like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself, amen to that. 1 John 3 and verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Maybe I got the wrong one. That's fine. The Bible says that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, to conform to Christ. The Christian in the Father and in Christ. The Christian is in the Father, rather, and in Christ Jesus. As believers, you're in the Father and in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go to all the references. <coughs> and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is in you, as is the Father and the Holy Spirit. Let's go to a few of these references. John 14, verse 17. Even the spirit of... Actually, let's, let's go back here. Verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Comforter here is capital. It's a person. Even This is who the comforter is. Even the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Of course, this was before Pentecost. Right? Verse 20, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Christ is in us, right? And then verse, um, and then verse 23 here, Jesus answered and said unto him, right, Judas, right, let's go back, verse 22, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him and make our abode with him. Amen. <coughs> Furthermore, we belong to Christ, and he belongs to God. We belong to Christ, and he belongs to God. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 23. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. You are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Amen. We are as secure as the Godhead itself, friends, and nothing can separate us from God. You're eternally, if you're born again, you're a child of God. You can never be a bastard. You're a child of God. 
You're either one or the other, and you're eternally secure. Yeah, we're saved by grace and kept by grace and kept by the power of God, and nothing can separate us from our God. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ and, in, and, being, and from being in Christ. Nothing. Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks, Lord, for the blessing of thy word, Lord, and I trust it was a blessing to thy people. And the doctrine of eternal security is a Bible doctrine, Lord. If anyone's sitting here, if anyone's sitting here and they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they've not personally received Him, they've not repented and believed the gospel, Lord, how that Jesus died for our sins and rose again from the grave, I pray, Lord, that today would be the day that they would receive Him. Today would be the day, Lord. It's not thy will that we put it off. It's not thy will that we should perish, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is thy will, Lord. And I pray, Lord, if anyone's here, anyone sitting here that does not know for sure that they're going to heaven, they need to get right with thee, Lord. The gospel is plain and simple. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It is that simple. That simple. In Jesus' precious name I pray these things. Amen.